Good afternoon. Thanks for joining in. As Devin said, I am the Director of Landscape and Urban Design at the Neighborhood Design Center. I've been working there since 2008, and since that time, some of my major clients have included the City of Columbus, Franklin County, and the United Way of Central Ohio. And today, I'd definitely like to give you an overview of what designer, design centers do in general, as well as some of the specific projects that we've done over the last few years. Currently, we're located at 1902 North High Street, and this is directly across from the Wexner Center at The Ohio State University. Our design center is partially funded by the City of Columbus and was initially a partnership between Ohio State and the City of Columbus. Um, currently, the space that we're in is provided by Campus Partners, which is um, a, a part of Ohio State, which we're very grateful for. Uh, we're not the only design center here in Ohio. Um, we, like the other three that I'm going to tell you about, are connected to Ohio State. Um, the other two are Cleveland and Cincinnati. Cleveland's uh, Urban Design Collaborative is part of the Kent State University, and they have an urban learning lab uh, in the theater district of Cleveland. And uh, the University of Cincinnati has done work in places like Over the Rhine and is associated with the University of Cincinnati. Uh, there's also one more design center that I know of in uh, Toledo, uh, not affiliated with the university, but a good group of guys running that too. Um, our, our specific scopes do vary between design centers, but our goal of the design center is to help identify new possibilities for Columbus and Central Ohio. We work in low to moderate income neighborhoods. That's one of the stipulations that we must work within. And we do various sorts of architectural design and planning work from science to storefronts, gardens, streetscapes, and whole communities. One of the uh, major design challenges and maybe even opportunities that we have uh, is that we focus on only conceptual design and we certainly do not do technical drawings. Um, if there's ever a need to get technical drawings done, we pass that off on, onto a licensed engineer or architect or other allied professional. And there's two basic types of projects that we do at the Neighborhood Design Center. Uh, the first is Neighborhood Commercial Revitalization, and we call that NCR for short. And then we have other fee-based work. The NCR program uh, is funded through the City of Columbus, and I'll get to more of that in a bit. Uh, the image that you're looking at right now is our staff and students. Um, our center is very unique as a 501c3. We have uh, an executive director, uh, myself as the director of landscape and urban design, uh, two full-time staff members, and then student interns that come from The Ohio State University, University of Cincinnati, and the Columbus College of Art and Design, all in varying disciplines, including landscape architecture, architecture, planning, and graphic design. Uh, we're really proud of our students. They do really great work under our supervision. A lot of the time, we allow them to take the lead on projects, and we'll, we'll just give them our suggestions as we go along. And uh, in 2010, the Landmarks Foundation was kind enough to award us with the Paul E. Young Student Award. Um, so back to the NCR. This is the meat and bones of the Neighborhood Design Center. We started back in 1982 um, with a charter really to help clean up the Short North area. And uh, while the Short North is no longer one of the NCR areas that we serve, we still do take a look at it. This image that you're taking a look at right now uh, was in one of our art exhibits in 2009, and it charts out uh, different uh, mappings of how different businesses are connected to others within the Short North. We also had taken a look at dating patterns and spending habits um, to help get a digital view of the Short North rather than just the physical. Um, here's also another image of Bodega uh, down in the Short North. This is one of the facades that we had done. The facades are a very traditional program that's been with us through the beginning. Um, to date, we have uh, several different corridors in Columbus that these services qualify for. And the awesome part about this is that they're free services. Um, we're able to work on Livingston Avenue, Cleveland Avenue, Parsons Avenue, and Broad Street 
in Franklinton and the Hilltop. So I'll be sharing some of those projects with you uh, now. Uh, this is right here on Main Street. If you take a look, um, this is 1053. Uh, right now there's a great uh, uh, luncheon place here, so I suggest you go ahead and check it out. Uh, but the image on the left is a conceptual rendering done by one of our architectural interns. And our typical process um, usually takes about 40 hours for our office to complete for each storefront. And uh, the process can take anywhere from a month to several, depending upon um, our workload, and as well as the client's meeting schedule. Uh, typically, we have a first meeting, and we go ahead and draw out uh, what the storefront owner really needs to see for their storefront. And, and we help um, just talk through different issues. Next time we'll come back, have a second meeting, and our interns will bring with them two to three varying concepts, all radically different, and help the, uh, the storefront owner make a decision on a final design direction. And then in a typically last and final meeting, um, we give them a design package that looks very similar to the one on the left. Sometimes a little bit of technical details, uh, but just enough so that a qualified contractor can go ahead and, and get things rolling. And as you can see, the product on the right, the after, looks fantastic. Um, so please come out and check it out. <laughs> um, this project right here, 983 Broad Street, is a continuation of our NCR facade program. However, in Franklinton, um, the Development Association and Board of Trade has been able to offer uh, a unique program that we've called FRAME. And this is the NCR program, but maybe on steroids. Uh, the NCR program gives our services to free to the storefront owners. But to get the work done, as long as the owner kicks in $3,000, the city will match up to $3,000. With this FRAME program, PNC graciously granted um, an additional match, so the storefronts could get $7,500 towards renovations rather than the typical $6,000. And this right here is one of the initial schemes that we came up with. Um, the goal here was to do 10 facades all at once. A lot of our work in the past has been piecemeal, um, just going to owners who have showed interest in the past. This time, we have specifically targeted owners, and we're hoping to give a more cohesive and more impactful look at the corridor. On the left, this map here shows all of the different businesses that we've been working with over the past two years in the program. And on the right is a short description of the FRAME program, which stands for Facade Renovation Affordability Made Easy. And uh, this is a snapshot outside the family market after the work's been passed off to one of our contractors to get some of the signage installed. Uh, this right here has two examples of storefronts that we've worked with. Uh, on the top is Josie's Pizza, and then on the bottom is Family Market. Uh, Josie's Pizza was really about the signage and... Um, Throughout the whole program, we've been very focused on getting uh, blue metal stripe, uh, coded Franklinton blue, uh, with addresses uh, to carry the cohesiveness that we're looking for along the corridor. And uh, we always go ahead and take an initial condition shot, and then this process worked just the same as others. We showed several concepts to the owners. And then uh, once we were able to get a final decision, we went ahead, made some detailed drawings, and um, helped renovate the facade signage, and we added some different trim options. Besides the NCR facade program, uh, the city dollars allow us to do some maybe non-traditional sorts of things in the corridors that other architectural or engineering firms might not be able to do. Uh, this right here is a photograph from Broad Street in the Hilltop. Uh, several years ago, um, the city was investigating adding a bike trail to, down Broad Street as a part of the mayor's new bike initiative, which is a great concept. Uh, however, many people in the corridor were under some un uh, uh, unrest because uh, this would, of course, take on-street parking away. And 
Simi had hired on some consultants, and unfortunately, they had only consulted with uh, the residents and not the business owners. So a little bit up in arms, uh, the Department of Development saw a really great opportunity for us to come in and work with the traffic engineers uh, to help come up with a solution that was more acceptable for everybody. So through this process, um, we met with about 30 business owners along the corridor and had them uh, fill out a survey and, and helped get a, a good picture of what was going along in the corridor and, and what makes their businesses tick. And we also um, surveyed each and every single parking spot um, from the alleys north and south uh, from Haig to Clarendon Avenue. No small task. Um, and with these numbers, we were able to help show that the businesses would no longer be able to park themselves if their on-street parking was taken away. And not only that, um, the alleys in this neighborhood are often used for drug trafficking, and many people are scared to go back there. Um, so even though people could park on the sides, there was less likelihood that people would. Um, so after many meetings, um, we were able to agree um, with the city and the people of the hilltop that the uh, bike lanes could come along uh, Broad Street. However, when it reached the specific portion, the bike trail would then pop up into one of the side streets on the north and then come back down. So it was a, it was a really great opportunity for community consensus building to, to help find the right answer. In addition to neighborhood commercial revitalization, the city has just started a new program called Mile on High within the past few years. Um, this specifically focuses on the downtown and trying to get some new reinvestment into these areas. It all started with uh, downtown retail inventory. Um, the outline portion shows all of the first floor storefronts that we had inventoried, we had taken a look at square footage, facade conditions, and uh, vacancies and occupancies. And with this information, we were able to pass that along to Capital Crossroads, and they've been able to use that to market uh, new programs and businesses into the area. Uh, with this funding, we've also been able to extend our facade programs and signage into areas like the downtown. Gay Street's been one of our jewels to work with. Um, we were able to help Jay Gumbos get some signage out there in, uh, in front of their storefront. And then we've also been able to create um, what we're calling inspirations uh, for the Mile on High area. These inspirations uh, looked at uh, the Wall Street Alley and decided what could be. No specific agenda, just something that would be really neat and eye-catching and could create a new livelihood in the downtown. So the image on the left is what's existing and the image on the right is uh, taking a look at what a little bit of plants and, and maybe some lighting can do. Uh, this is also that same study from Wall Street. Uh, these are affordable concepts that can be done relatively easily. Uh, this more or less is just paint on the walls, uh, but done in a very artistic manner and gets some new street character going. And then this is uh, a maybe more green scheme, but it also incorporates um, some different painting with the wine bottle that says this way up and just makes this a corridor that's a little bit more pedestrian friendly and opens it to new activities, which could also be an art market or whatnot. And then most recently, uh, we've been able to work with the Gay Street Merchants to get a, pr a banner program going. And these banners run along the entire stretch of the downtown corridor. And um, from front to Cleveland, these change orange to this blue color. And uh, it's completely funded by the merchants. Um, and they're up right now, and they look great. I think you should go check them out. Um, grab a sugar, da sugar Daddy's Brownie while you're down there. Um, we're really proud to see what's going on there, and we're happy to continue to work with them. Um, besides the traditional city programs that we've done, we've made new partnerships in, in uh, recent years. We have found a great partner in Columbus Public Health. With them, we have uh, established Columbus Art Walk Maps, and this was a program that started with just three maps. 
and since that time it's grown to over nine and in just the first summer we were very proud um, there were over a thousand clicks to download our map from their website and over 300 call-ins to a number that allowed you to view artworks and hear about the history and the neighborhood that you're in and these maps are a great way to tie architecture um, to public health. It gets people out and about walking their city and it's a, it's a good point of pride. Um, so as you see the three digit numbers on the right with the pictures, uh, that those are the indicators for our call in. And uh, these different routes uh, usually are a mile to two miles and uh, are pretty manageable uh, and, and safe walking routes. Um, other work that we do is uh, with the uh, United Way. We do uh, apply for a lot of different grants. We've uh, worked with the Columbus Foundation and other funders. Uh, but United Way is one of our bigger ones right now. And three of the neighborhoods that we're helping with this funding are Wineland Park, King Lincoln, and the near south side. Uh, Wineland Park is the neighborhood that I'm managing uh, one of the projects for. And this is a three-year grant, um, so I know it pretty intimately. Um, in the first year, it was really great. Um, our funding allowed us to basically just have um, some very detailed interviews and um, consensus building conversations about what with our skill set we should be doing in the neighborhood. This was definitely non-traditional. Um, for our profession, uh, but it's resulted in some really great opportunities. Um, to the left, you'll see uh, a family tree, or <laughs> so I call it, of all of the people who have helped us to get to where we are. Uh, there's been many partnerships that have been forged, including between our funders, the Ohio State University, um, places like Keep Columbus Beautiful, and uh, one of the uh, housing uh, facility operations, CPO, they've been extremely helpful. Um, if you take a look to the right, there's some images of what a lot of the alley conditions look like in Wineland Park. Um, so we, with our, our beautification influences, um, decided to tackle the trash issues. Uh, there's many academics that work in Wineland Park, so we figured it would be safe and out of everyone's hair and, and doing a real service to the community. Um, in order to help facilitate beautification and clean up in the neighborhood, it was really important to understand what sort of conditions existed. Uh, so in the first year in 2010, um, myself and uh, one of our interns, Kent, we had surveyed uh, the entire neighborhood boundaries uh, with some, of, some help from our friends from the volunteer committee. And we were able to chart where there were conditions of overflowing trash, where there were broken dumpsters and missing lids, and uh, where there were bulk items that needed to be picked up. And with this information, we worked with uh, Jeff Johnson from the Refuse Division, who has been a great help. Um, we were able to uh, take this information from Excel, put it into GIS, and make these maps. And from that, he was able to have his crews come out and put new garbage cans where they were broken um, and put additional cans where there was overflowing trash and address bulk items. A lot of people don't know this, but bulk items can't be picked up within the city of Columbus unless it's called ahead. Um, so with that partnership between uh, the summer and autumn, we were able to make a, a good dent in uh, some of the trash issues in Wineland Park. And one of the great things about these visuals, we were able to take them to the Wineland Park Festival and share this with the community at large. So that's helped uh, gain a lot of support for what we're doing. And we realized that even though we made a good dent in the trash issues in uh, 2010, it wasn't enough. Uh, between then and the summer of 2011, things sort of fell back into disrepair um, since people were not calling in these issues. So in order to uh, remediate this, we realized that it was necessary to inform people um, how to call 311 at, and that these services were available. Wildland Park is a very transient neighborhood and residents are in and out of there um, mainly because this is a student population and uh, young families that are moving in and out on, on the east side. 
Um, so in order to inform people, we realized it needed to be a widespread effort. We didn't want to create flyers. This would be something that would just create more garbage in the alleyways. So we went ahead, and at the next Wineland Park Festival, we brought three signs, which are shown at the bottom of the screen. And we worked with the residents and uh, came up with a final design for an industrial strength sticker that's shown on the top. And then on the right is uh, the actual sticker in placement. And uh, th these stickers are intentionally very graphic. Um, many people in Wildland Park don't speak English as their first language, so that's very important that everyone can understand them. And uh, these signs have also been translated into Spanish and are available for viewing on the web. So hopefully we can reach a broader audience with that. And since the installation of these stickers um, in the autumn, you can check out our winter numbers, and uh, Wildland Park is looking a lot better. Um, on the right, we have, on the bottom right, we have combined data from 2010 and 2011, and we've been able to combine densities of where we've been seeing the most issues. So in this year, we're uh, going to be working with the community to target reoccurring issues and uh, see if we can put a halt to that. Um, in addition to our other beautification efforts, we've also been working with a committee to get some Wyoming Park signage installed that's sort of similar to um, the neighborhood signage in the short north. In our other two neighborhoods, I'm a little less familiar with them, uh, but our great staff, uh, Jen and Katie, are managing those projects. Um, Jen has been working um, with a great neighborhood guy. His name is Al Edmondson, and he has a lot of respect in the community. And uh, from her conversations in the first year, she was able to understand that health is a really big issue in King Lincoln, especially diabetes. Um, so many of her efforts have been focused towards alerting people of these sorts of dangers. And um, some of the products that she's been able to make are... Um, diabetes screening locations maps for the neighborhood and then she's been able to work with the neighborhood to get a, a healthy cookbook going um, to promote all sorts of wellness and then um, in this year she's working on the American African American Cultural Arts Festival and she's been working uh, with their team uh, and she did the logo design which we're really proud of and then um, on the right, um, she's also been, she's forged a partnership with Columbus Collegiate Academy. Uh, they're a charter school here on Main Street. And uh, there's seventh and eighth grade students. Um, we worked with a group of honors kids. And we were able to bring a session of four architectural classroom lessons to them. And we took them through a design process, much, very similar to what, we do in our professional life, uh, teaching them about site analysis and different precedents that they could look at. And we walked them through an exercise uh, in their own co courtyard where we were able to design healthy alternatives and um, perhaps bring this up to date. And uh, with that, we taught them how to draw plans, read scales, and even build models. Uh, then over on the near south side, Katie has been heading up that. And uh, this has been a really interesting neighborhood. Um, there's many different factions within the neighborhood, sometimes competing for one another's in, um, attention <laughs> to gain volunteers. So it's been a little bit of a challenge, um, but we've been able to identify a need on Livingston Avenue uh, to have some beautification done. Uh, so Katie's been able to, through a series of uh, public charrettes, uh, identify different areas of focus and one of those focuses uh, will be installing um, some sorts of gateway features uh, with some additional funding that we've been able to receive through grant makers. Uh, beyond the work that we do in uh, Columbus's commercial corridors, we also do a lot of work with Franklin County planning. Uh, we've uh, worked with many of the different townships around town. Um, most uh, recently, we've uh, worked with uh, Clinton Township, and uh, this drawing right here is of the Cleveland Avenue 2020 plan that we've made for them. 
And uh, this just took a look at different streetscape elements and treatments that could help make this very stark and dangerous uh, street uh, a little bit nicer and uh, improved. Um, we're also happy to mention that it had received an APA Central Ohio Design of the Year Award. Um, among some of the treatments in that plan uh, called for uh, increasing lighting, uh, adding safer places for bicycles to travel, and then uh, adding some, some form of pride with some banners. Um, to the right is a study that we had also worked on during that same year with uh, Blendon Township. Uh, this was very similar. We worked uh, on identifying gateway features and uh, other physical aspects that could improve their community. And through that, we identified a need for a uh, parks master plan. Um, so the next year, Franklin County asked us back to come and examine that with them. And uh, beyond that partnership, uh, we sort of took it a step further and uh, worked with students from The Ohio State University on this project, uh, which was uh, a great challenge, but it was also very rewarding at the end um, just to uh, get everyone on the same page. Uh, it was it was great. Um, the Neighborhood Design Center led our typical charrette process and we were able to incorporate the students through that. Um, we had uh, a survey that we gave out on the first time to get a sense of what sorts of uses um, the community has now and then uh, what sort of needs they foresee in the future. With that information, we were able to take that back to the students and share some of our expertise with them, um, not only about what we knew of the community, but about public process in general. Uh, with that information, the students were able to create many iterations of uh, one of the parks. And uh, this was really a great experiment because we ended up with 30 or so completely different designs by the end of the course, uh, rather than just two or three from our office. Um, this was a really rewarding experience for the students because many times um, projects can be a little arbitrary and this was, uh, it, I think it gave them a sense of, of uh, obligation in a sense because this was a project for real clients. Um, with the students' work, we presented that at a final meeting, uh, or a, a second meeting, we were able to select five of the most different schemes and, and some of the best. And with that, we were able to use that to guide conversations towards what our final design schemes would be. And uh, some of the combinations are seen right here for the final plans. And one of the great things about this project uh, was that it did receive some accolades from Draw Magazine, so we're happy to see that. And then uh, beyond Columbus and Franklin County, uh, we, we do work in Central Ohio. Uh, one of our greatest clients to date has been the city of Newark. Uh, the partnership between us and them has forged uh, even before my time at the Design Center. In 2007, uh, our design team was out and working on redesigns of their East Main Street. Um, one of the challenges for the city of Newark is that a lot of citizens, especially on the east side, don't have cars, so bicycles are the primary modes of transportation. So we worked out different um, park areas where uh, bicyclists could rest and different opportunities for them to bike safe. In the second year, um, I came into the picture and I led our team on a fourth street study. Uh, this took a look at uh, how you get into Newark from 161, uh, as well as the 4th Street corridor in itself. Uh, with the help of the residents of Newark, we were able to identify a need for different planting pallets along the street. We realized that many of the businesses would get covered by larger trees, um, but small trees could uh, make the road seem a little larger than it was at times. So uh, we devised a system that I call a conditional landscape. And these conditions specify tree types rather than specific trees and um, are identified based on their situated locations. And in this diagram, you can see uh, the different rhythms that are created with the conditional landscaping. Um, the blue bars 
also infill areas that have been uh, have had buildings demolished and bring in uh, new buildings that match the character and scale and feel of the community. And then uh, right here are just two blow-ups of uh, the 4th Street corridor that we had taken a look at and uh, some of the different tree spacings. Um, there was a very clear connection um, between the horizontal bands of the streets such as Main and Canal Street. And with this, we were able to identify another need in the community um, to, to get some bike trails uh, that ran throughout the city. Uh, if you see on the diagram on the left, uh, the yellow lines are where there were existing bike trails, and uh, the centerpieces did not exist. So to be able to move people efficiently through the city, uh, we helped identify different routes through the city that would create spokes that would uh, get people out to its extents more efficiently. Um, to date, they've been able to install some of the bike lanes that we've proposed, and they've worked on securing some funding to get um, the green path on the bottom in which is uh, it's near the river and then uh, since we do have a great working relationship with them we were asked back out last year to study the courthouse square and the funny thing about the courthouse is that in all of our other previous studies all conversations one way or another always came back to the courthouse square this is definitely a point of pride for everyone so in this study we're, fi we're finally happy to be able to help them uh, work through some new designs for the landscape. Um, one of the great things about the courthouse square is that as it is, people pretty much already like it. So we didn't need to propose many radical things. Um, we did help with a phasing plan, um, not shown here, but we were able in phase one to uh, update things like lighting fixtures just by uh, changing out the bulbs, and then providing maintenance to some trees which required it. Um, and then as we move further along, we do manipulate the uh, pathways and then update the existing gazebo. And then with that, I'd like to open things up to questions. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, as you guys are sending in your questions, uh, we're going to take a brief moment here to go over a few announcements with you guys. Um, to start off, uh, our conference is coming up very quickly. If you have not registered, you have a few more days to take advantage of the early bird registration before the price increases. Uh, the price increase occurs, I believe, on April 13th. Uh, and after that, you have until April 27th before the late fee kicks in. So hurry up and register to save yourself some, some money and see a great conference here in Toledo. And the conference is going to be occurring May 8th, 9th, and 10th in Toledo at the Grand Plaza Hotel downtown on Summit Street. Uh, we have a lot of great events for you this year. Uh, please visit our website, heritageohio.org, to find out about those sessions and the tours we're offering this year. And we can guarantee you're going to have a great time this year. Now, also... Uh, we like to remind you guys of our mission every time we do one of these webinars, uh, just to let you know what we do, what we can offer, and uh, how we can assist your community. Uh, as Ohio's official historic preservation and Main Street organization, Heritage, Heritage Ohio fosters economic development and sustainability through preservation of historic buildings, revitalization of downtowns and neighborhoods, and commercial districts, as well as promotion of cultural tourism. So if you enjoyed today's webinar, please think about becoming a member of Heritage Ohio, and you can find out more information about becoming a member at our website, once again, at www.heritageohio.org. And we'd like to thank Cheryl and the Neighborhood Design Center today for doing this webinar. This is a fantastic webinar, and uh, I think everyone has enjoyed it so far, and we hope that you uh, check them out. Okay, let's see what questions we have. Oh, we'll give you guys a few more minutes for questions. Um, and if you have no questions today, uh, you can check out this webinar later uh, at our website. And you can find more information on that at www.heritageohio.org.
com slash program slash webinars. Also, while we're waiting here, I'd like to mention that we have an exhibit coming up at the Ohio State Urban Arts Space. It's called Progress and Promise, and some of the work shown today will be featured uh, in a little bit more detail, as well as some of our work uh, with Columbus's urban neighborhoods. That's going to run from June 19th to August 14th, so we hope that if you're in town, you can come out and check us out. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, we now have some questions coming in. That's good. Uh, first, uh, Don is asking, do you come as far east as Guernsey County? We certainly can. Um, the only stipulation is that we have to work in low to moderate income neighborhoods. Um, and if uh, you have a project in mind, I'm always happy to talk. Um, please give me an email or um, give me a call. Our number is 614-221-5001, and I'm extension 73. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, Mary's asking, um, is there any way to share outside large cities? Do you think that means to share our services? Uh, possibly. Uh, Mary, could you clarify? Uh, we'll go to the next question while you can uh, clarify that, Mary. Um, how is the Neighborhood Design Center funded again? Uh, community development block grants, general funding, uh, who supports it? Only the city of Columbus or counties around Columbus? Our funding is definitely one of the more interesting topics uh, at the Design Center, and it always is week to week. Um, our, uh, the majority of our funds does come from the city of Columbus, uh, and that's community block grant dollars. Um, however, uh, the rest of our uh, funding does come up from a fee basis and uh, with the grants that we receive uh, from our different funders. Uh, uh, going back to Mary's previous question, uh, yes, the share the services outside of a large city. Well, I do know that um, in Toledo, there's a, a smaller group that's working and uh, that's a group of uh, retired architects uh, that do share their services. Um, in uh, our, our own work, um, one of our, our maybe downfalls may be that uh, we do have to get the funding uh, to first work in certain areas. Um, but many cities are available to receive community block grant dollars. Um, so that is helpful. And then, um, Similar sorts of offerings that we give um, can also be provided by other uh, local universities. While some don't have uh, landscape architecture or architecture programs, many do have urban design programs. And uh, we've been able to uh, work out with a few of them uh, uh, throughout our journeys. Um, one of them, Denison University, another one, Wittenberg. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Mary has another question. Uh, is this webinar available for watching at a later date? Yes, Mary. As long as it records correctly, yes, it will. <laughs> uh, we've only had one that didn't record uh, correctly, so it should be available within the week, and I will let everyone know on this webinar when the materials are available for you to view. Thanks. Uh, we'll just give you one more moment if there are any other questions. And uh, once again, we'd like to thank Cheryl and the design, our Neighborhood Design Center today uh, for doing this webinar. Uh, and remind any of you AIA members out there, once again, uh, please email me uh, if you would like credit for today's webinar. Uh, and also if you'd like a certificate of completion. And if you do, your mailing address for that. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So thank you guys for attending today. Uh, our next webinar coming up, uh, we have a few of them. Uh, next, or in two weeks, uh, April uh, 13th week, uh, you're going to be able to find... Uh, the college webinar series. This is going to be something interesting we're going to be doing uh, with the historic preservation programs offered in Ohio. And I'm going to be visiting each one of these campuses and they're going to be presenting their uh, historic preservation programs to you all. So if you're interested, do you have any kids coming up to college A's that you'd like to get into historic preservation, uh, remember to check those out. And our next official webinar is going to be on May 4th and that's going to be dealing with land banks. So the Cleveland Land Bank has graciously uh, agreed to it attend with us. So uh, you'll be checking that out. And uh, thank you again. And thanks, Cheryl. And thank we you. hope you have a good day. Thank you.